topic of the talk is infinite cardinality. I'm going to talk about what is cardinality and it's basically on set theory. So major points in today's talk, we'll learn about uh, basics of set theory. We'll see how to deal with infinite cardinality and few applications from there. So I think everyone is familiar with this term, rational number. It's just a number that can be represented of the form P by Q, where P and Q are co-prime integers and Q not equal zero. And the opposite of this, we can call it non-rational number. I think everyone knows about it. It's an irrational number. And it's nothing but a real number which can't be represented in the form P by Q. Just the opposite of it. So by the end of today's talk, we will see how to prove the existence of irrational number by just counting. Before we start, we should be knowing what is counting. Counting is just a rule which we use to match things. It's a unique way of associating a number to an object. Let's understand about this rule better by the end of this. As, a, as I said, counting is a way of mapping things. You map things from your mind to real objects in the world. Like this. You have four numbers in your mind and you map it to four. Like from one, it goes to one of them. Second, it goes to the other thing. And third, so you get to know there are four guavas as it is. Or else, the second type of is mapping from mind to mind. You have four, you think of four numbers like 8, 9, 10, 11. How do you know it's four? Because there is a parallel thing like 1, 2, 3, 4 and you map between them. 1 to 8, 2 to 9 and 3 to 10 and 4 to 11. Similarly, you map objects from real, real world to real world. Like you have three parking slots. How do you know? Because you can think of one car going there, second going here, third going there. That's how you know there are three spots. I think everyone is fine with that. Everyone is on the same page. Yeah. Yeah, few terms which I will be using like this. There's these other terms which I made. I'll the set A where I'll call it a shooting stand from where I'll hit the arrows which is called matches to set B. And this is the target stand. Basically, like an archer. You stand here and shoot something out there. And I'll say that the number of terms in set A as 3. And I'll use this special symbol. This is just a convention which we use. I'll use a special symbol for this and a special symbol for this. Fine everyone. Okay. The same thing which I said in mathematical language, the set A which I drew. We call this shooting stand which I said as the domain, just for your information. And this the whole target stand is called co domain. And the things which are shooted like in the previous example, as you see, there were three shootings out here. And these three are called the range, but the whole thing is called the codomain. And the last one, as I said, uh, these matchings are called a function. Like you define a function from here to here which maps things from set A to set B. And as I said, the number of elements which are used like this is known as cardinality of A. And that refers to the number of elements which is 3. I think everyone is fine until now. First, let's define one one. Okay. Uh, you can think of the roll numbers which institution gave you. Like a person A can be will be given one not one. B will be given one or two like that. Last child might be given nine hundred, but there are still more numbers left. This is a type of one one rule. Like where one thing is mapped to the other, but there are things left out in the target child. It's the same if you go to the parking slot. There might be four cars parked here, but there are four more remaining slots where the car haven't parked. So there are eight things here and four things here. And each is mapped to one, but there are still things remain. This is known as 1-1 one, one rule. And basically, what are the conclusions we draw from 1-1 one, one rule? Every target should be hit at most once. You can see here. These are hit once, but these are hit. These aren't hit. That means it's hit zero times. We can see that the target stand has more elements and than the shooting stand. And in the mathematical language, we see that the target, uh, the target stand, which I say will represent it by A, and I say that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to B because we don't know if it's equal. And this is called injective mapping in the terms of mathematical language. Another type of rule which I will say is onto rule. In this we can take the example of cartons. Like each, they think there are 5 balls and you have 3 cartons. How will you pack? 
two in one, two in one, and one in the other. This is a type of rule where each things can be mapped, uh, where uh, things in set A can be mapped to the same thing in target B. So we can see that two things in set A are mapped to the same thing. And the conclusions that we draw from this, every target stand should be hit at most one, at least once. You can see these are hit two, two and one. There is nothing which with zero elements hit to it. And we can see that the shooting stand has more elements. I think you can clearly see it five and three. In mathemat in mathematical language, we say it's less than or equal to b. This is called subjective mapping. Fine, everyone. Yeah. Let's come to the counting rule, which I said. Counting rule is, is a rule which satisfies both these rules. That is, cardinality of A is less than or equal to cardinality of B and greater than or equal to cardinality of B, which means nothing else, but this is the only thing it supports. So, this is the counting rule which I have uh, just said, and you can always see that, target, uh, that every target is set only once. And both the shooting stand and target have the same number of elements. And it's called a bijective mapping in the terms of mathematical relation. An example could be like how I said how you count things. Like you take one apple and uh, one mango and count it, uh, map it to one, and like this. You know there are four apples, and this is an example of bijective mapping. Bijective mapping. So a small exercise. Um, can people see like which function is one one or which one on two? Like first one, one one, yeah, yeah. It turns out to be the correct answer. Second one, yeah, high school. I need good ones. On two, yeah, correct. Sorry, it's a bijective function. Both oh, has the same. No, no, we yeah. people this. Yeah. This is the second. You can see the same. It's constant. <laughs> okay, third one. On two. Yeah, you can see this. You can see. But what about the fourth? Uh, that is nine. Yeah, sure. Okay, coming. What is the cardinality of natural numbers? Any guesses? Was it like cardinality? You just said number of. Them. Okay, fine. This is set A, and think there are two. Like there are things like this. That, is, that means cardinality of A is nothing but the number of elements in A. And I think you can see this, you can clearly see that cardinality of this is 4. So there is infinite. Yeah, correct. We take it to be infinite because you don't know what to do. Yeah, what will be the cardinality of whole numbers? As you said, natural number is infinite. What about this? Infinite. How? Oh. Okay. Infinite was the correct answer, but how do you know it's the same? Okay, is it the same infinity of the natural numbers? Yes. Yes. How? Uh, because we can do one, uh, one one mapping. One one mapping doesn't say it's the same. But we can see that every number uh, in the whole numbers can be uh, for any n number in the whole numbers group can be mapped onto n plus one in the Natural numbers. Yeah, correct. Turns out to be it's the same as the natural numbers. You can map everything to the same number, like the one after it. Zero can be mapped to one, one to two, two to three, and goes on. And it's a bijective function, as you can see. So as I said, bijective function in the sense both element, both the set will have the same cardinality. So it turns out to be the same. So how do you differentiate this? And important. How do you differentiate infinite and a finite set? Or else it's the property of an infinite set. Infinite set is the set which has bijective function to its subset. You can clearly see in the case of finite, there might be four things and its subset might be having just two. You can't have a bijective function with this because the number of elements clearly sees it's not equal. But in infinite, I just showed an example, whole numbers and natural numbers. So what about the cardinality of integer? Yeah, integer. Again, infinite. Is it the same? Yeah. How? Oh. Um. Okay, it's the correct answer, but I need a bijective mapping to say it's the same. So we start with zero. Yeah. One. Okay. I have the natural numbers going on here. Uh, zero. And here is the integer. Yeah. Start from zero. 
Uh, we'll actually rearrange the numbers a bit so that it's 0, 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2, 3, minus 3, like that. Right. And um, yeah. then we map uh, 0 to 0, 1 to 1, minus 1 to 2, right? And then we see that there's a, a rule which comes up, right, to map any number. Yeah. 1 to 0 to 0, and all the odd numbers to the positive numbers, and all the even numbers to the negative numbers. That's how you can see there is a my check to map it because. All the things are equal, like or everything is hit only once, and this is how it turns out to be. It's a bijective function. Yeah, there's the same thing which I have drawn here, and it continuously goes on until the end. Okay, in mathematics, it's a common trend to name something when you see too much, like if it's common everywhere. We define it something called countably infinite. It's that if a set has a count, uh, same cardinality as natural numbers, which are Give an example like integers, whole numbers, and all. We'll call them as countably infinite sets. An example could be an all sets of even numbers, just even numbers. Okay. Also, and one more condition for a countably infinite thing to satisfy is that it should be listed up. Like it can be arranged as a list a one, a two, a three, and go somewhere. Okay. Uh, coming to on uh, famous theorem in the set theory language. Um, this was known as Sheldon Weinstein theorem, but it was first uh, uh, proposed by Cantor without a proof. So it's also known as Cantor Sheldon Weinstein theorem. This theorem states that if I'm, uh, if there are two sets and there is an injective mapping from here to here and also an injective mapping from here to here, it says that the cardinality of A should be cardinality of P. This is one of the way where you Say that two cardinal, uh, two sets have the same cardinal. This is this isn't so obvious as you see, but it turns out to be the same. Uh, do you people want the proof of it? I don't have it here. I should give it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I school program might be it goes about your head, but don't mind it. I'll give a small pictorial proof. I think you can see it for finite sets. How it's why is it true? But I'll only talk of infinite sets. Let there be a set A, like it continuously goes on, and a set B. Um, uh, set A and set B. Yeah. We'll have it uh, by injective mapping from B to A, such that like this. It is mapped to all the things except this part, which I'll call as A0. Fine? This is G. Yeah. Fine? But also we'll have the same. Better to draw we'll, all, we'll also have an injective mapping from A to B, a function f which is mapping you up here, leaving it all the space. So we can, shall I use that side? Is it fine? Yeah. Can you people see? Yeah. So we do a clever thing from A naught. Yeah, the space I have said it's A now. We have an injective function like this. To some space, we name it as B now, the space it covers. And from here, we have a function G, which gives A1. And from here, it continuously goes on. Fine, it goes on like this, everyone can see it. Yeah, so we, uh, so B, B of N is nothing but F of A of N. Fine. Yeah, so we we'll define a bijective function now. But okay, uh, one more thing. So these are the these are the spaces which doesn't have any mapping right now. So we'll give another function g inverse, which goes out like this. Everyone can see this. Okay. So we we'll define a function h, a bijective function, as is a piecewise function which we we'll define f of x, if x is an element in this set, if x belongs to, okay, uh, let us define another set s, which is union of, which is union of all this a1, a2, a3, and b1, a1. Fine. If x belongs to the set of s, we will have this mapping. If it doesn't belong, And else, 
will have G inverse of X. Fine? Find the way I have stated this. Now we can clear this C. Fx from here to here, these spaces which are not uh, colored, ha, is a bijective function. I think everyone can clear this C because everything is mapped just once, like the natural numbers or anything which we take. And also the uncolored spaces, I mean, the shaded places are mapped to the other part of shaded spaces, which are equal. Sorry. I think everyone can see this. So, this is nothing but two collection of a bijective function, which turns out wholly is a bijective function. Fine, everyone got with the proof. You don't understand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the things which we know, let's I'll derive few things. Okay. Uh, let's take a condition. We'll have the set of whole natural numbers, and we'll just take out one. We we'll take one and give one. We we'll take one and give one. It's nothing but the collection of all odd numbers. So, what is the cardinality of this resultant set? It's the same, same as the natural numbers. Yeah. yeah. Great. So, what we get is this. And it turns out to be it's the same as the natural numbers because you always have a bijective function which, as I stated, even numbers are comfortably fine. Comes from it. Corollary of, corollary of it is nothing but this is cardinality of odd numbers should be the same as natural numbers. So, what we can say from this infinite subset of a countable set is countable. It's nothing but you are taking countable set, uncountable set, like this, and it goes on. It's not a finite thing that you are doing, you are going to the n or n odd numbers. So, when it turns out, as you know, there is a bijective function, it's countable. And similar to this, the opposite of it. I think everyone knows uncountable set, which which is not countable, like which doesn't have the same cardinality as natural numbers. We'll come to that later, but take this as a point. Infinite superset of an uncountable set is uncountable. So the next thing we'll see another example. Let us think of a condition. We write all the natural numbers in a row and in the column. We go on. But one thing. Uh, all the numbers should be distinct in their nature. Like these things might not be equal or equal. We don't know about it. So if we go on writing like this, the set think of a set like this. Like you have one, two, three, four, and eight, and I go on writing simply you now anything on this. What will the cardinality of this resultant set which I get? It will be countable. Uh, you are supposed to draw diagonals, right? So, like, and you are supposed to draw a uh, diagonal one uh, passing to one. No, no, the other way. How? Uh, like this. One to eight. Uh, no, right. Like one pa only passing to eight. Okay. One Right, then passing to two and eight, then passing to three B and whatever, right? And then we can map it like that. What about the things here? Right, so um, it will go on forever. Right. Like this? Yeah. Uh, right, so. But these are different things on their own. Yeah, so first we'll map 1 to 1, then 2 to 2, then A to 3, then 3 to 4, then B to. Right. Like this. Along the. Yeah, like that. Like that. And it goes on. Yeah. So what does this happen? So that means every single number in this set can be mapped to uh, natural numbers. Yeah. So, so the, uh, therefore, its cardinality is uh, the same. It's counter key. Right. That's how it works. So, we will map, as you have said, countable infinite should be in the form of a list. You can write this as well. There are various uh, things you can always draw. You can take a thread and mark on it. You, you can do any of you want. You can do like this for the way I have drawn. Like this, you can map things and you can list out things like this. So. It turns out it's the same as natural numbers because it can be listed as I have said. What we can conclude from this? Product of two countably infinite set is countable. As I have said, there are well, countable number of rows and countable number of columns. So, product of two countable set is still countable. Or else we can do a clear thing. 
some more song like that. The next number will be having some next inverted number. So we can clearly see that this number will not be in the list because the nth digit of the number will not be uh, same of this nth number in this list. Nth digit out here will not be same to the nth number out there. I think you can clear like the first thing out here, one is not equal to zero, so the first number is one. Second thing is zero, so that is one. Third is zero, and but here it's one, so even that is one. And it goes on like this. Nothing but an induction proof. So you can see this, this this number will not be in the list. So what does this mean? It will be uncountably infinite. Yeah. Turns out to be it's true. The new number which we get in the list, which I wrote, is this. It will be different. The nth digit of this number will be uh, different from the nth number out there in this list. So by contradictory, we have listed out the things, but we couldn't list all the things. So by contradiction, this set uh, doesn't have countable, countable. Yeah, this doesn't have the cardinality of countable. Or, or else of the natural number. This is an example of uncountable, uncountable infinite set. So the direct application of what you have just did is nothing but all triggers are uncountably infinite. We can clearly see because all the binary strings which you have written can be written in the form 0, 0.1 and goes on. Like this, you can always write the real numbers like this. And we have seen that the small portion of the real numbers is uncountably infinite. So clearly the whole thing should be uncountably infinite. Also by this, it's clearly notable that every complex number is nothing but of the form A plus IQ. And A is a real number and B is also a real number. We can clearly see that this itself is uncountably infinite. So adding anything to it will not make any difference. It's still uncountably infinite. I think everyone is good at this. So, let me define the new thing. These are, I'll say these are algebraic numbers. These are the numbers which can be modified by zero by just using addition, subtraction, multiplication or raising to a power of a natural number. We can see the examples like 8, if you subtract 8, you get 0. 27, root of 27, if you square and subtract 27, you get nothing but 0. But remember, all you are doing is nothing but with the use of a natural number. We can see, uh, this example too, which I have written. We have seen, you multiply 3, uh, add 2, square it and subtract it with 5. You get nothing but 0. There are many algebraic numbers like this. These are the few examples out of them. So, let, me look, uh, let us look at them carefully. If you replace the number with just an x out here, What we get, if you simplify this, is nothing but equal number. And clearly you can see that the, this polynomial has the root which you have just made. And so, we can conclude that it is it's a root of a polynomial with some constant coefficient, uh, with some coefficient and a constant degree. So, are there any non-algebraic numbers? Yeah, Five. Fine. What are they? Yeah, but how do you prove it? Any idea? However, it's so sure that Pi is not a solution to a polynomial. There is a geometric and circle drawing group, right? Okay, there is a big proof which says, which I am not going to state, but phi is a transcendental number. Good. So, we can clearly observe that all the algebraic numbers are solution for a polynomial of a finite degree, like what I have written. I forgot, but some polynomial you write, but the solution for this will be an algebraic number. Clear with it? But we can always write for a specific degree, take 2, you can always uh, write. The coefficient, you can always have any natural number with it, like 1, 2, and it goes on. And for it, and for all the degrees which you have, you can always write 
1, 2, 3, 4, and Z. First one, like, it's a table, like, it's nothing but natural numbers, cross natural numbers out here. So I think just we have seen, but this count, this set which you have said is equal to the is countably infinite because count, uh, product of two countable set is countable. So I think you can clearly see that the number of algebraic numbers are just countable. Wait, so those are the coefficients of that power in the polygon. Yeah, these are the powers written, and these are the coefficients for. It. Fine, everyone. Everyone in the same page. So, we can say that the algebraic numbers are countably infinite But, we just know that the reals are uncountably infinite So, think, there is the real space out here And, there is all the rational numbers out here What is this space filled with in the middle? We know that uncountably infinite is greater than countably infinite What will be this space filled with? The rational is under Sorry? Wait, the inner one is the rational. This is the real thing, and this is the all the algebraic numbers. Sorry, oh, algebra. sorry, sorry. Yeah. What will? What are this? Non-rational numbers. Yeah. They are called transcendental numbers, but I have said they are not algebraic numbers. It means they are transcendental numbers. Examples are pi e lang two two. Yeah, it's actually two power root two. Two root two is a solution of some. For number, you can clearly see. And these are called transcendental numbers. So, on a complex plane, if you mark all the uh, algebraic numbers, this, this is how it turns out to be. All these five spaces are nothing but transcendental numbers, which are not the solution of any polynomial. I so, have a doubt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why are there like concentrations of like circles where there are the very few? On um, algebraic numbers? I'm not sure of it, but you know that these numbers are nothing but i, pi, and all. There is a circle which is, I think you are familiar with complex numbers. This is nothing but the solutions of this circle is nothing but cos theta plus i sin theta. And that, that's nothing but r e power i t. And many of these things are a solution of complex. Uh, like if you write x square equals minus two, sorry. And you can add two things and get this circle out here normally because you are just going through an angle. This comes out to be the same. This I just I got a picture from the Wikipedia just for your knowledge here. So a clear puzzle for everyone. I won't be giving the proof now, but if you if you are done with that and if you want the proof. You can contact me. Prove that there can't be a bijective function from a set and its powers. I think everyone knows what is a power. Powers. Anyone want me to do? Okay. Uh, think of a set. How many elements do you want? Don't say anything. I can't. Well, some good numbers. Power set of this is nothing but the set which contains all the subset of this. And it goes on. It's a finite number. It's nothing but two power. There are four elements, so it's two power four. There are sixteen elements. I didn't write all the things, but there are sixteen elements in the power set of this. You can clearly see in finite set you can't have. But what about in finite set? Will there be a bijective function from its set to its power set? I know I have said the answer, but anyone who gets the proof. Uh, can contact me and I will say if it's proper or not. Okay, uh, I, would end, I would like to end the talk with the thought. Mathematics is not about numbers, equation, computations or algorithms. It's all about understanding. And I would also like to thank all the math teachers who have supported me for this talk, especially uh, STC and Swedish. Okay, thank you everyone. Any doubts or anything you can say me now. Yeah. Can you just give like a gist of the proof why pi is transcendental? I just counted and said that. Huh?
I meant like, I will write numbers are this much, but uncountably infinite are uh, real three. So, these spaces are nothing but filled with transparent. How does my pi falls into that? Why, why does pi have to fall out there? Yes, it's really bad, it's like very comp. Some calculus proof is that I don't know about it much. I don't know. Like, I've just seen it, but I forgot. Any other doubts? Or anything you want to see? Fine. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.